Amen. Judges chapter 13. Judges chapter 13. We, we are today going to begin looking at the life of Samson, but you can't really look at the life of Samson without looking at his parents. And so this, this chapter is really concerning the parents of Samson. You know, as you consider things in the Bible and you think of the greatest people in the Bible, some of them are as great as they are because of the parents that they had. I take the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was a great man of God. The Bible says that the Lord counted him faithful before he called him. So that he called him to do that because he was already faithful. So he already had some work ethic. He already had some, some devotion. He already had some faithfulness about him. That doesn't just come out of nowhere. A lot of times that stuff is taught. Now Samson, believe it or not, is a great man in the Bible. He's a carnal man. And, but the things that he does do for the Lord, they start somewhere. Let's go to Judges chapter 13. We'll start verse 1. The Bible says, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. Does it not seem like every time that we come together on Sunday morning in Sunday school that we read a statement that sounds just like that one? Here's the problem that we have in society, and believe it or not, this is in the notes, so I'm not just running a rampant rabbit trail. Uh, the problem that we have, guys, is that we see the Lord chastening us, and we just think it's for nothing, right? We think, oh, I guess it's just what Pastor was talking about Wednesday night. Life happens, and that is true. Life does happen, but sometimes it happens because we messed up. Right? Every time that you find that the nation of Israel is in bondage and they're serving another nation and somebody else has taken over, it's because of the statement we just read. They did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And Christians, oftentimes we, we, we act like we can live however we want and then everything's just going to go smoothly and God's just going to pour out blessings because we live in the New Testament Christianity. It's all grace, Right? Uh, there's only a very small element of truth to that. Very small. We, we do understand that. But living for the Lord is something that we ought to be doing out of gratitude. Listen to this. This is going to sound crazy. Do you know why the nation of Israel should have lived for the Lord? Gratitude. They did nothing. When, when God called Abraham, Genesis chapter 12, and said, I'm going to make of you a great nation. Abraham didn't do anything. It's not like he said, Lord, how about pick me? He, nothing. God just said, hey, that's the guy. I'm going to pick that guy. I'm going to call that guy. I'm going to use that guy. I'm going to make something out of that guy. Nothing. Okay, when I got saved, listen, I got saved 100% in the mercy of God. If you're saved in here... I didn't do anything that deserved salvation. I think God, in his mercy and kindness, leads and directs Abraham. Abraham serves God, leads and directs Isaac. Isaac serves God. Jacob goes back and forth a little bit, but then he, he follows God. Then his, his children go to Egypt. They serve in Egypt 400 some odd years. And God, in his mercy, remembered. The Bible says God remembered Abraham. And his covenant with Abraham. He didn't say, oh, these guys deserve my help. He didn't, none of that. He remembered his covenant with Abraham. Okay, side note. Kings. When we get to the book of Kings and Chronicles, and you find all these kings in Judah, the Bible says that God does, has mercy on them for David, my servant's sake. You know when God didn't destroy Lot? It was for Abraham's sake. There are things that take place because God's just so good. Okay, so they didn't, they didn't deserve to be rescued from Egypt. They didn't deserve the land. God was just honoring a promise he made with Abraham. So out of gratitude, they should have just said, we're sticking with God. Just gratitude. That's the same thing any Christian should be able to say. Lord, I don't deserve salvation. I deserve to be in hell. That's just a fact. Right? I don't deserve the mercy of God. Lord, so because I'm thankful, I'm going to serve you. Just, just for that. 
alone. Just, just that. By its, you don't need any more. And then there's still more, but you don't need it. What I'm saying is, I should say this, we shouldn't need it. I shouldn't need God to continually bless me every day and help me overcome my problems and, and help me to fight my battle. I shouldn't need that. I should just, out of gratitude, just say, Lord, I'm your robot. Right, whatever you need, I don't even think for myself, I'm just following you. That's how we should be. We're not wired that way. And God doesn't want robotic service. He wants a heart of service. But that heart should be there because of how good he is. I, 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 don't, want, I don't want my life to be read down the road somewhere centuries from now. I know we're giving ourselves a lot of credit. And think, the things... The things that took place was because he did evil again in the sight of the Lord. I don't, I don't want to think, well, God had to judge him again. Here we are, chapter 13. This is the sixth time that that statement is made in the book of Judges. It is the sixth time that another nation has come in and conquered Israel because they did evil again in the sight of the Lord. We don't want our life to be read that way. I don't want my life to be read, and there he was on his face again because he did evil again in the sight of the Lord. I, even in Judges, it sometimes gets, it gets ridiculous. You're like, now here, a lot of time is going by. Okay, we understand that this isn't two days later. But even still, our heart should be so with the Lord that time doesn't change the goodness of God. And, and so I'm going to say one more thing, and then we'll go on to the passage. A lot of times what happens is because of the influences that we surround ourselves with, the, the impact of salvation becomes diluted. Okay, think about the, the nation of Israel in this passage. When you are around the gods of Ashtaroth and the gods of Ammon and the gods of Moab and the gods of the Canaanites, it dilutes what God has actually done. And because it's diluted, the appreciation, the service out of gratitude becomes, he's just one of many. And that happens in our society. Our society so dilutes the power of God that when we pray for something, and we've got, we got a relative in the hospital, and we're begging God for mercy, and then God heals them. And we make it like the doctors did something wonderful. And we dilute what God is doing. And we make light of the fact that we, we, we begged God, we petitioned God. So if he used the doctor to do something, amen. But I'm not giving that doctor the credit. I asked God for help. I got help. It was God. And if, if we don't think that way, we will not serve out of appreciation. We will serve out of, well, it's just chance. Time and chance happens to us all. No, no. And the mercy of God happened to, to those also. So let's, let's go. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines 40 years. This is the longest that they have been in bondage in the entire book of Judges. And, so the, and the next longest was, was in Deborah's time. That was 20 years. So 40 years, a long time. Think about your children are born in servitude and live to 40 years of age, never knowing the freedom. That's something. Verse 2, And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and bare not. Now I started to explain what barren is, but we got verse 3. Verse 3 tells us what barren means. Look at this. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman and said unto her, Behold now, thou art barren. And bear us not. Have you found this interesting? This is, this is fun. It's so neat when the Bible makes this statement. Remember when Joshua was old and stricken in years? And then the Lord came to Joshua and said, Behold, thou art old and stricken in years. It's like, here's the fact. And then God came to tell you it. Amen? In this day and time, you wouldn't need to tell a lady she was barren. Because it would have been a weight on her. It would have been something she struggled with. Because it's not America where career is first. It's a time in Israel where they understood 
how God intended life to go. And so these, this, she, you wouldn't have to be like, hey, you're barren. She would know. Notice verse, the, the second half, behold, now thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. There are several significant men in the Bible who were born to a woman who was barren. Almost like God just, he does that as an intro, introduction to this great man. I mean, think about it. Isaac was born to Sarah, who was barren. Jacob was born to Rebecca, who was barren. Samuel was born to Hannah, who was barren. John the Baptist was born to Elizabeth, who was barren. These are great men. Then you have Samson, a great man. I know we got pro- we're going to deal with some problems in Samson. Samson's a great type of Christianity. Uh, but he's a great man. I mean, he does some things for God. Notice what he continues to say. Thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now, therefore, beware, I pray thee. In the entire chapter, I think there's not anything more significant than what he just said right there. This is the angel of the Lord. Consider this. The angel of the Lord speaks to you and says, I pray thee. That's not a command. It's not an order. It's like, hey, would you do this for me? That's the spirit behind I pray thee. When you read I pray thee, that's, that's the attitude that you see there, right? He's God. You understand that? You don't have to pray nothing. And he says, hey, beware. I, that, I think that's amazing. That he is speaking to this woman and he says, hey, because of what I'm going to do and what I'm going to do through you, I'm asking you, that's what prayer, I pray thee is a request. I am requesting that you honor what I'm trying to do. Take and put that in, in the mentality of a Christian in today's day and time. That is exactly how God treats us today. Exactly. There are commands throughout the Bible, and praise the Lord, we ought to follow them. But oftentimes, we have a choice to do one or of two things. And God says, for the benefit of what I'm trying to accomplish, wouldn't you, couldn't you just do it this way? That, that is, I don't even have the words to describe the graciousness of our God. Because we ought to just fall on our face and say, Lord, what would you have me do and do it? Take the order, take the command. But God, who leads in such grace and such compassion and such mercy, doesn't say, hey, fix your, he says, what? you know you're just hurting yourself. I mean, you read the Bible, you find the spirit of God is, you know you're just going to hurt yourself. You know you're just going to hurt my reputation to others. You know you're just going to hurt your neighbors. And God doesn't say, and sometimes he does. But often he, he says, I pray thee. That teaches us some things. When you look at the way God articulates, it teaches us how to articulate. I, I, I don't have more authority than the Lord. And this is what he's dealing with. Now, now notice verse 4. Now, therefore, beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For, lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver out of the hands of the Philistines. So, an angel of the Lord coming to her, you're barren, but you're about to bear a son. But here's the thing, it's not just any son. It's a son that God has chosen to do a great task. And as God has chosen Samson to do this great task, he says, from the womb, this this boy, this man, is going to be a Nazarite. All right, what we learn in this passage contradicts most of what society would tell you. And that is that this child is a child before he, quote unquote, exists. He He is nurtured by what his mother is eating, and God says he's a child, and even that, from the womb, he said from the womb he's a Nazarite, which means if you eat things that he shouldn't eat, that means he's getting it. 
because he's a child. And God said, from the womb, I want that child to be pure and separate from everybody else. And that's what a Nazarite vow is. Take your Bible and let's look at that. Um, Numbers chapter 6. Numbers chapter 6. I thought in my mind, in my study, sometimes you take for granted things. The vow of the Nazarite was given in Numbers chapter 6. And the only time you see it fulfilled clearly is in the life of Samson. Now, I believe other people took that vow. And some people think that Samuel was a Nazarite. Some people think that John the Baptist was a Nazarite. And they may have been, but the Bible doesn't tell you that that very clearly. Uh, the, The Bible speaks to certain attributes of a Nazarite, like Samson. Hannah told the Lord and no razor should come to his head. It could be that she made him that way. The Lord told, told Zechariah about John the Baptist of the things that he couldn't eat. Could be a Nazarite vow that way, but we don't know that for sure as we do for Samson. But look at Numbers chapter 6, and we'll start in verse 1. The Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord. He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes nor eat moist grapes or dried. All the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation, there shall no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled in the which he separated himself unto the Lord. He shall be holy and shall let the locks of his hair or of his head grow. All the days of his sep- all the days that he separated himself unto the Lord, he shall come at no dead body. He shall not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother, for his brother, for his sister when they die, because the consecration of his God is upon his head. Now, we're not going to continue. We're going we're to look more into this passage as we look at the life of Samson. But for the sake of what the angel of the Lord has just told his mother, he is, he is not to be shaven. He's not to have a razor touch his head. And then it says, and the locks of his hair are supposed to just grow. And then it's, it's required that this Nazarite would not eat anything that comes from the vine at all, nothing. So, you know, we would say, well, no, no strong drink or no wine. I mean, he couldn't eat raisins, according to what we just read. I mean, he couldn't have it. And that, that's the snack for children. Poor Samson was deprived. No wonder he was a grumpy old man. <laughs> Amen. He never had any raisins. But, but, but the mentality is, it, it is, a, is a vow of separation. Now, I'm not teaching, nor would I ever teach, that, that God's people ought to be Nazarites. Okay? The Bible says in the New Testament that for a man to have long hair, it's a shame. And yet we find in our passage, he can't shave his head. Because it's very different. It's one specific thing that, that God says, in that case, in this case, he is separate from everything else and everyone else. Okay, I'm not teaching that we should be Nazarites, but I do believe, and I believe the Bible bears witness to every Christian ought to live a separated life. God is holy, and we are his representatives on this earth. We, we, ought, we ought not to blend as much as we can in with the world so that they can't tell that we're a Christian. They ought to be able to know that I'm a Christian. And they ought to be able to know every one of us a Christian. And how do they know that? Well, because I tell them. No, they know that because we have separated from things. There are things on the job that they do that we don't. There are places that they make go for lunch that you won't. There are, there are language that they speak that I don't. I'm not using those, those profanities. God's people should be far from that. We're not one of them. We are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. It's his. He owns me. He bought me. And and he bought me and I'm thankful. You say, oh, I'm owned in America today. And people are like, I'm my own man. 
I am thankful to be purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm not my own. I'm thrilled. Guess what I would do with this life? Trash it. He can do something with your life if you give it to him. But we try to be in control. We ruin it. Look at Samson. Now, we, now maybe not everybody here knows the life of Samson. He's going to make a mess. And then he's going to do it again and again. And God is still, because of God, still going to use him to do wonderful things. Come back to our passage, Judges chapter 13. And notice verse 5. Verse 5 says, For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. Uh, if I didn't say this already, a Nazarite is one who is separated from others and consecrated to God. That, that definition defines Christianity. It really does. Now, maybe not to the extent of a Nazarite, in that we are not bound under certain law, but to be separate from something is not enough. To say, I don't do that and I don't do that, we're going to look at that. Matter of fact, just today, as we, as we cover the subject of charity a little bit more, to say, I don't do this and I don't do that is, is only a very, very small part of any, any Christian's heart. The other part, after being separate, is to be consecrated to something. It's like, it's like saying, I'm not going to listen to this foul corrupt music, okay? But if you just don't listen to that and you don't replace it with something wholesome, there's no value. Like the value goes very, very low. <laughs> but when we say, I'm going to leave this and follow that, Paul told Timothy, flee youthful lusts. Flee youthful lusts. Then he said, and follow after righteousness. Like you're running from something, but you're chasing something else. That's the vow of a Nazarite. I'm, I'm avoiding all of the corruption that goes on even amongst God's people because I am wholly devoted to God. Now, the Nazarite vow was typically done, as we read in, in Numbers chapter 6, it was typically done for a period of time. The Bible told us that Samson was to be a Nazarite from, his, from the womb to his death. He, he didn't get to pick, I'm going to consecrate myself to the Lord, God picked him in the same way that he did for John the Baptist. John the Baptist was born to do what he did. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, that Jeremiah was born to do what he did. So it wasn't, it wasn't that they, had, they, they were called and they submitted and yielded to the call. No, no, they were called and Ezekiel said, I tried not to preach. But it was in me as a burning and I could not forbear. Like God made it so that he had to do it. Right? That's Old Testament stuff. But it, it, I almost wish God would do that for me now. You know? Lord, I struggle with boldness and courage. Could you make it so that I just can't help it? <laughs> but once again, God doesn't want robotic service. He wants a heart. Notice verse 5, the end, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Okay, so we understand that, that he begins to deliver. Uh, we know that Eli, Saul, and ultimately David would complete this deliverance. He's going to begin. But my question is, and as we look at his life, I'm going to ask this question again and again. What if he was fully devoted to God and not himself? Could he have completely delivered the nation of Israel instead of just begin? I'm, I'm thankful. When I think of deliverance, I think of the Lord. I don't think, well, he began to deliver me, and, and as I live for the Lord, he's going to. No, the deliverance is done. Okay? Now, he's still perfecting us. Right? We're, we're, we're going unto a perfect man. That's, what we're, that's the goal. But the deliverance isn't a process. The nation of Israel in this case is a process that lasted generations. That's, that's how long they served the Philistines. And he began to deliver them. And then Eli picked up where he left off 
And then Saul continued, or Samuel continued that, then Saul continued that, and then David finally wiped out the Philistines and freed Israel completely. I'm glad my salvation doesn't take that. You sit under a pastor for so long, and he gets me so far, and then I got to go to another church, and then he gets me a little further, and eventually maybe I can be saved. That would be depressing. But deliverance, when God does it, is just done, delivered. Problem is, side note, problem is, they're delivered over and over again. And then they continually do evil again and again in the sight of the Lord. That was the, that was the longer part of the lesson. We'll, we'll move a little faster as we go through this. Verse 6, then the woman came and told her husband, saying, a man of God came unto me, and his countenance was like the countenance of an angel of God. Very terrible. That just means he was a scary looking guy. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told me, neither told he me his name. Real quick, she said, this is a man of God. He never said that. She identified him. He's an angel. Okay, we understand that. But she identified him as associated with God. In a time where they're worshiping several gods in Israel, she knew that that fellow was godly. I'm just saying. The world ought to know if we're a man or woman of God. We, we shouldn't, we, I know I said that already, but we shouldn't be so much like them that if we don't say that we're a Christian, they'll never know. That should not be the case. He did not say, I'm an angel of the Lord. Matter of fact, in the entire chapter, he never, they perceived it eventually. He never said, I'm from God, sent to you. None, none of that. But she said, hey, there's a man of God who came to me. That ought to be the case with us in our life. When you walk on the job, you ought to be known as a man of God or a lady of God. We oughtn't be known as one of the, one of the we're one of the team. Uh-uh. I'm on the winning side. I don't, look, I don't want to be unkind, but I don't want my life to be reflected and be part of people who will die and go to hell. And their life and my life looks the same. They don't even know God. And I have his Holy Spirit in me and his word. And my life looks like theirs. There's something very wrong with that. that, that that's, that's, not the, that's not the God of the Bible. That's not the impact that the Lord would have for us to have. He's identified without saying a word. And you find that throughout the scriptures. Verse 6, I'm sorry, verse 7. But he said unto me, Behold, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and now drink no wine nor strong drink, neither eat any unclean thing, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah entreated the Lord. Entreat is much like we see in verse 4 where he, I pray thee. He is imploring God, Lord. I have a request. I'm petitioning the Lord and said, O oh my Lord, let the man of God, which thou didst send, come again unto us and teach us what we shall do unto the child that shall be born. Let me tell you about Manoah. I don't know much about Manoah, but I like him. He didn't say, I don't know about that. Who do you think? I don't know. If God was going to do something, he would have come through me. He didn't do that. He, he said, Lord, the child that shall be born, like, I believe what you told my wife. That's a blessing. Then he said, the child that shall be born, would you come and teach? He didn't say, come and tell me so that you can verify what was said so that I can know it's true. That's not what he said. By his language, you can tell that he believed every word she said. You can tell that by his language. But what he was asking isn't for proof. What he's asking for is more information. Lord, is there anything that I need to know in bringing this child up? That's what he's asking for. And God hearkened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again unto the woman as she sat in the field. But Noah, her husband, was not with her. So God says, yeah, I'll answer your prayer. I'm going back to her. 
probably walks closer to me anyway. I don't believe that to be so. I think they both walked with God. Verse, verse t- I, can, I mean, I'm just looking at his, his mentality as such, and hers is of submission. They're both submissive people. And the woman made haste and ran and showed her husband and said unto him, Behold, the man hath appeared unto me that came unto me the other day. And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said, Art thou the man that spakest unto the woman? And he said, I am. And Manoah said, Now let thy words come to pass. How shall we order the child? He didn't say, Now let thy words come to pass because I've seen you. He's just, in, in the statement is, Your words will come to pass. I understand. Here's the question. Okay? How shall we order the child and how shall we do unto him? And the angel of the Lord said unto Manoah, Of all that I said unto the woman, let her beware. She may not eat of anything that cometh of the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. And Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, I pray thee, let us detain thee until we shall have made ready a kid for thee. Now, the angel responded with the same information. There's nothing new given. It's, this is it. I, I'm going to say this and understand, understand my heart about this. We live in a society of people who care more about what a child eats than how a child behaves. And, and I'm not saying that, that that's all that they're doing here, but the only instruction they were given is what this child should eat. And if you read the life of Samson, he's a knucklehead. He is a self-centered, carnal man. We live in a society where people are more worried about the child's allergies than they are whether or not that child will grow up to be righteous. Okay, but you're doing nothing. Nothing will happen profitable. It's a weird day that we live in. It is a strange day. Used to be people cared how children behaved. Now we care whether or not he has a rash on his finger. I'm not saying not to care. I'm saying we oughtn't leave the other undone. And I believe, I believe, based upon looking at Samson, that he was coddled and he was given everything he wanted and it didn't help him. I believe, it, and here's where I, okay, come, 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 come back around full circle. I believe he had godly parents. These people, like they are submissive to what the Lord says. But godly people don't always make the best parents. It, it takes more than that. That's, just, that's the start. That's the baseline. After that, we still need to instill certain characteristics and character traits in our children if they're going to be anything for God. God used Samson. Look, in the next couple of weeks, as we look at the life of Samson, you know what we're going to see? We're going to see a guy who wasn't told no. He's not used to not getting his way. That's not good. <laughs> it is so good for us to be told no. God tells me no, and it bothers me. And I've been told no my whole life. Because we want what we want. But you can see as you read the life of Samson, he was not used to not getting what he wanted. So we we worried about his diet, but we left something very important alone. And I think we got to be careful. We got to be careful. Verse 16, the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, though thou detain me, I will not eat of thy bread. And if thou wilt offer a burnt offering, thou must offer it unto the Lord. For Manoah knew not that he was an angel of the Lord. Now, consider where we are and what time we are. We are in, we are in a time where they are worshiping and offering to everything. He says, if you're going to offer something, it's got to go to God. It can't, be, it, it can't be for me or anything else. Offerings go to God. And that's what the, the heart of them, that's, that's the heart of an offering. Verse 17, Manoah said unto the angel of the Lord, What is thy name? That when thy sayings come to pass, 
we may do thee honor. He didn't say if. He said when. He believed this man. He believed the angel. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is a secret? Now, how would Manoah know it was a secret? Why are you asking that? You know, it's a, it's a secret. Well, I didn't know it was a secret. Now I do. Thanks. Verse 19, so Manoah took a kid with a meat offering and offered it upon a rock unto the Lord. And the angel did wondrously. And Manoah and his wife looked on. For it came to pass when the flame went up toward heaven from off the altar, that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of, of the altar. And Manoah and his wife looked on it and fell on their faces to the ground. That's not something you see every day. You know, maybe you do. You need to get off of whatever you're taking. All right. But so they offered this offering to the Lord. We can get into the fact that they're not, they're not at the tabernacle. They're offering in a high place, all of that. But, but the heart of their offering is true. The reason that the high places were forbidden in the Bible was because people would use them as a shortcut that leads to something else. It always led to something else. You, you, you understand principles in the Bible when you see why God puts them there. God wasn't opposed to offerings. Abraham never had a tabernacle. And God accepted every one of his offerings. Why is a high place forbidden later? The high place was forbidden later because the heart of the people, God's words, they go a whoring after that. And they set things up in its place. And even the things that God ordained, they had to tear down because they will worship anything but God. People like what they can see. So they fall on their faces to the ground, verse 21, but the angel of the Lord did no more appear to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was an angel of the Lord. I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to know something different about that guy when he ascends in a flame up to heaven. That's not a regular fella. Amen. So if you want to know, did I entertain an angel like the fireplace? <laughs> I'm kidding. Amen. I don't even have a fireplace. Verse 22. And Manoah said unto his wife, We shall surely die because we have seen God. It's an interesting statement. And it goes back to many that we've covered where people in the emotion of a moment completely forget all that God has just said. Okay, so we just saw God. We're going to die. Well, then, we're not going to have a baby if we just die. Like, he just said you're going to have a baby. This happens. This isn't the only time I, I, I can think of at least three times that we've covered that exact thought. Where somebody's like, oh, no. Now what? I mean, now what? God just gave you instructions for the future, which means you have a future. That's a blessing. There's some satisfaction in understanding the scriptures. There's just some satisfaction in knowing that, hey, my life is preserved because he's given me commands for tomorrow, which means I'm going to see tomorrow. That's a blessing. And his wife, once again, but his wife said unto him, if the Lord were pleased to kill us, this is the voice of reason. He would not have received a burnt offering and a meat offering at our hands. Neither would he have showed us all these things, nor would as at this time have told us such things as these. Hey, Manoah, I know you're the man, but if you don't mind, can I point out that he just told us we're going to have a baby which doesn't exist. We can't be dead and have a baby. Like, it's a, I mean, like, right? That's what, I'm being sarcastic slightly, but at the same time, I'm being very serious. Like, hey, um, what you just said doesn't make any sense. It happened. Verse 24, And the woman bare a son and called his name Samson. And the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. That is, that is wonderful. God blessed this fella, even, even from the youngest of ages. 
Verse 25, notice, And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtael. God was able to move. And this is, this is interesting. We are Old Testament. You can't always take everything that's in the Old Testament and apply it to New Testament, okay? God, he's not going to move in our heart to do something if we're not walking with him. In the Old Testament, we just gave examples of how Ezekiel tried not to do right and God forced him because the Old Testament was a different time. Same with Jeremiah. Jeremiah didn't really have a choice. God formed him in his mother's womb for that purpose, Jeremiah 1.5. And so as we look at those things, we think, okay, God is moving Samson. If God only moved Samson when Samson was walking with God as he does for a Christian today, Samson would not have accomplished anything. But God used him in spite of himself because God chose to. Here's the question, all of that aside, can God move us? Can God say, look, I want you to go over there and talk to that person about me. And we say, okay, I'm going. Or are we so fixed and so devoted in our life, well, I'm, I've got this to do. I find sometimes I'm, I'm so occupied with what I'm trying to accomplish that things will go on right around me and I will completely miss them. And God ought to be able to move us to change our direction. I think there are people who are so determined that they want to be on a mission field that God couldn't put them in a position in America because I'm because you made a plan and God didn't, but you did, and God can't move you another way. That's sad. To the same point, I think there are people who sit in churches all over America. And God would use them somewhere on some other field if they would just let go of their money or let go of their job or let go of, I, I've got to be around, I want my kids to meet their grandparents. And we don't sacrifice for the Lord and therefore God can't move us. God was able to move Samson in a different way. We've got to be so wholeheartedly surrendered to God for him to move us. We've got to be yielded to the Spirit of God for him to move us. He's not going to just smack us in the back of the head and say, hey, wake up, I need you today. I wish he would sometimes. I do. But he's not, he's, he's a gentleman who says, I pray you, go talk to your neighbor. He, he didn't grab you by the, the scruff of the neck and just put you on your neighbor's front door and say, now witness. He prays you do it, though. He requests it. There are things that God should be able to move us to do, but we are so occupied with what we have going on. We miss it. That's a sad truth, but it's a truth. Amen. Father, thank you, Lord, for the scriptures. I pray, God, as we look at the life of Samson in the coming weeks, Lord, that you would open our eyes to see many, many things that would help us with our life, with our Christian walk with our witness. I pray that you would use this in a great way in our lives, Lord. Help us now, I pray, as we, as we try to transition our minds and focus on the Word of God this morning. Help us, Lord, in the fellowship and sweet time that we have today, Lord. We thank you for this privilege, this opportunity. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen.